Thanks very much, Tim, and thanks for Share Cafe to, uh, for the introduction to present today. Um, today, I want to talk to you about QVE. As, as Tim mentioned, it's a, a listed investment company listed back in 2014, uh, managed by Investors Mutual. And for those who don't know Investors Mutual, we're a, a Sydney-based uh, fund manager with a dedicated team of 11 investment professionals based here in Sydney, focused purely on Australian equities. Um, and we've got a long track record of um, managing retail money uh, for investors um, over a 23-year track record of you know, delivering consistent outcomes and trying to deliver you know, really resilient portfolios in down markets and trying to generate some income through, through, um, through the equity cycles. As Tim mentioned, it's focused purely on the X20 sector of the market. Um, the company itself, QVE, is led by an experienced board with an independent chairman, I mean, Peter McKillop, um, and the you know, fee structure is a flat fee that tapers down, there's no performance fee. I mean, really our focus is on long-term capital growth um, through time and also generating you know, some income. And I'll talk about income quite a bit in this presentation because we think it's quite an important part of the return you can generate from an equity, from owning equities in the Australian market. If we turn to the next slide, um, just in terms of the investment philosophy behind Investors Mutual, that's been consistent since our inception in 1998. Um, really what we're looking for, for is companies that have got a competitive advantage. So often we, you know, we're looking for companies that are leaders in their field and that gives them more control over their destiny, uh, means the share prices are more consistent in their performance and the earnings outcomes are more consistent as well um, and gives them some, you know, some um, control over their destiny. We look for businesses with re re recurring predictable earnings streams. So we tend to avoid, you know, have a smaller exposure to the resources sector and contractors. And we try to focus on you know, good quality businesses that are generating recurring predictable earnings, which means that the underlying share prices of those businesses are, again, more consistent. We look for businesses run by capable management. And I think one of the things in the DNA of the team in the IML is to manage, is to spend a lot of time talking to the management teams and building a good knowledge set about the businesses we own. We want businesses that can grow. And as a value manager, we want to buy stocks um, when they're trading at a, at a discount to our assess, assessment of the valuation. Um, and we are very much focused on, on valuations in terms of the, of the portfolio. If we look at the next slide, that really um, you know, parlays into what we've seen over the last, um, last four or five years, really. It's been um, the last few years pre-COVID, so this prior to this time last year. It was a market that was very momentum-based. Um, the Australian economy had been in a pretty low growth environment, but interest rates were very low. Um, and that was driving um, excessive valuations in particular sectors and also a lot of speculative um, investing. And so what we saw with a lot of um, share prices trading at very frothy valuations and moving you know, really on news flow or, or momentum and, and some investors gravitating those stocks with not so much based on fundamentals, but basically on a them thematic. Obviously we've had COVID, which has been a, you know, really accentuated that in, in a way with interest rates being cut. Um, and a lot of the stocks that we own physically impacted as their operations were suspended um, due to the you know, physical movements of, about COVID. What we have seen though more recently in the March quarter in particular is that you know, it's been a, with the opening up of a lot of physical activity and a fear that you know, interest rates were going to be higher, we've seen a real reversion back to more of these traditional um, stocks that we own. Um, and that was really, it um, comes, comes down in terms of the performance we saw in the March quarter where stocks such as Crown, Events and, and Tabcorp uh, we're either recipients of corporate interest or, um, you know, you know, investors gravitating those stocks as the outlook for the earnings for the earnings for that business has improved, and also a couple of stock specific factors you know, led to that. Um, if we go to the next slide, just talking about, you know, you know, talked about how the frothy the market had been over the last twelve months, but particularly, uh, sorry, the last four or five years, but particularly over the last twelve months, as I said, interest rates are at record lows, and a lot of investors feeling like they would never get a return on their on their capital in the bank. Um, really you know, drove investors for the first time into the, mark, the market and really gravitating to, to story stocks. So companies such as Tesla, Afterpay, Bitcoin, uh, you know, a huge range of these more um, thematic stocks where good, constant good news flow has, has fed you know, valuations to, to the point where all these companies are trading well in excess of what we think are underlying valuations. And again, obviously, Bitcoin is sort of very hard to assess what the underlying value of that, of that, of that coin is. Um, but there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the, the emergence of, of coin and, and um, digital currencies. But really, I think just highlights that a lot of assets have been bid up to excessive valuations. And in that environment, if you look at the next slide, 
what we think is really um, permeated is that there's some of these really good quality companies, companies such as Horizon, which owns you know significant infrastructure in Queensland that transports the the, the coal, met coal predominantly to market. Amcor, which is one of the leading packaging companies in the world, Tabcorp, which operates the online gaming uh, online lottery business, which is effectively a legislative monopoly, and obviously their wagering business as well or Ampol, which is one of the largest fuel distribution uh, retailing businesses in the country. If you look at the graphs of these share prices, over the last five years, the share prices have actually been flat, uh, obviously impacted by COVID, and we've had a bit of a rally recently, but we think fundamentally still, you know, these businesses are reasonably priced. Uh, we have some really good assets, um, and you're fundamentally in a better position coming out of COVID than they might have been a couple of years ago, to be honest, um, certainly in the case of tab corporate interest for their waging business. So we think, you know, um, you know, a lot of these stocks have been left behind, you know, in a market that's been quite frothy. And the yield that these stocks generate is also very attractive. So we turn to the next slide, just talking about, so, you know, stocks specifically held in the portfolio. I touched on Amcor, but we've got quite a big exposure in QVE uh, to the packaging sector. Uh, why? Well, the reason we like the, this sector is that it, it um, packaging tends to generate a very recurring predictable earnings stream. So, a lot of the household goods or goods used in industry require packaging for the transportation of fluids and, and goods from the factory via the distribution center to the consumer or to industry. And that packaging is made by companies such as Aurora with you know, the aluminium cans or their glass bottles. Amcor in the flexible sector is you know, a global leader. Uh, Propac and Pact, smaller businesses, but again, operate in the plastic sector. They all operate with relatively longer term of contracts. The businesses, once the factories are built, they tend to be quite cash generative. And that enables the reinvestment of the business, but also the payment of dividends over time. And I think importantly as well is um, scale is a major is a major advantage for these bigger players in their industries, all leaders in their segments that they operate in, or number two players. As the as the economy moves to more of a uh, an environment where we have to recycle more of our our goods, um, one of the big companies, many of the big companies such as Unilever, Procter and Gamble, and Asahi, are looking to re use recycled product in their in their supply chain. So the more of the packaging is, is recycled as opposed to put to landfill. And it is the scale players in the industries, companies such as Amcor and Propac and Pact, that are innovating and bringing those innovative solutions that allows the use of recycling. And so I think, you know, that recycling theme really um, solidifies and plays to the strength of these businesses. So we like the, this, this, this sector of the market because it is quite a resilient part of the market. If you look to the turn of the next slide, just talk about another stock in the portfolio, a company that we, you know, is probably not well understood or well known by the market, um, but really typifies some of the stocks that we own is a company called Osnet. Um, it's a regulated utility based in Victoria. So Osnet owns the electricity distribution uh, businesses that effectively the grid that allows the distribution of power um, in the suburbs of Melbourne and some of the Western districts of, of Victoria. It also owns the gas distribution business, again, uh, you know, regulated utility and the transmission business. Um, so these are the big poles and wires, the picture on the right really um, you know, is, is an example of the big transmission uh, assets that they operate. Um, often these businesses are perceived to be um, you know, low risk, sorry, low, low growth. Um, but if you look at the asset base they operate, the, the table at the bottom shows that the asset base that Osnet operates has grown about six and six and a quarter percent compound over the last 10 years, which is you know, quite a significant but a consistent growth business. And it's the income that that asset base generates, um, which allows the payment of a dividend um, and also the dues allows the business to be reinvested to grow the asset base. Um, significantly, um, we think you know, going forward, the, the transmission business is, is coming to a period of quite strong growth. And that's really underpinned by the growth of renewable generation. Um, so in Victoria, they've got a target of 50% renewables by 2030. Currently, they're at 25%. That generation is in the west of the state, which is a very different area to the, where the power is currently um, generated in the Latrobe Valley. And as that transmission, as those, you know, that generation grows, obviously, there has to be a significant investment in the transmission assets. Um, really, uh, Osnet will be the, the party that facilitates that. That asset base growth will fuel um, ongoing growth in the distributions and in the asset base and, and earnings of the business. Um, and so, it's, you know, it's a stock that we own and look quite like given the distribution price profile, particularly in a low growth environment. Look at the next slide, just talking about, you know, dividends in particular. I talked about Osnet and also Spark infrastructure. Both these stocks trade at sort of five and a half, five point eight percent yields. I mentioned Horizon um, and Amcor. Also, you know, very resilient businesses generating good cash, yielding 6.7% fully franks in the case of Horizon and, and Amcor 4.5%. Um, and also Metcash, which is the third force in consumer um, staples behind Woolworths and Coles. They, this is the wholesale that supplies um, the independent 
grocery sector, which is a sector of the market which has been growing quite strongly through, through COVID, and they also own um, the, the number two uh, player in the hardware sector and number two player in the liquor sales. Both those businesses have been growing quite nicely and generate good cash. And Charter Hall Retail, which owns a portfolio of, of suburban and, and regional um, shopping centres under, underpinned effectively by Coles and Woolies, you six and a half percent of the current price. So again, there are good quality in, income, good quality businesses outside the top 20, which generate good income. And I think that's the key for us in terms of generating some income and also capital growth through time. So we just look at the next slide. In terms of the NTA, uh, as it in March, it was 107. We publish an NTA every week. Last published NTA last Monday was 108. Um, the performance over the short term, you know, I talked about how in the March quarter we saw more of a reversion to more of some of these value stocks as the reopening trade emerged. Um, so we delivered 6.5% for the quarter ahead of the benchmark. But as I mentioned over the last last few years, um, we have lagged the market, which has been quite momentum based and also obviously some strength in some of the resource stocks, um, which we've got a very low weighting to. Uh, next slide. Uh, in terms of the dividends, I've talked about you know the income and the importance of income for for us and for investors. Um, we've declared at the beginning of this financial year that we would pay 4.4 cents uh, per share, fully franked. We're paying that quarterly now. We were paying semi-annually. We now pay that 1.1 cents quarterly. Next X date is the 17th of May. That dividend will pay on the 4th of June. Um, and frustratingly, the, the share price has traded at a discount, significant discount at some points to the to the assessed NTA. And we think that you know the NTA is you know represents some really good quality businesses, companies such as Tabcorp, Crown, Events. Uh, leaders in their industries and Amcor, for instance. So we, you know, in, in light of that, we've we've instigated a buyback. We've been quite active in that buyback, and we bought about bought back about 33 million shares. Um, and the on-market buyback has the capacity to buy another 30, 13 million shares, and that's one way we can narrow the discount by buying shares at a discount to NTA is is, is accretive for, for investors and adds to the NTA per per uh, per share for those those shareholders of state who uh, hold the company. Just in terms of the dividends, if you look at the next slide. Um, you know, we've been able to grow um, the dividend um, over time. Um, we've been growing, paying 2.2 2 cents for the last few years. Um, we committed with a period of um, difficulty in FY21. Obviously, a lot of the companies we own suspended their dividends because of COVID. Uh, companies such as Events, which owns the um, event cinema chain and hotel operations, Sky City in New Zealand with their casino. Tab Corp also was affected. So a lot of the companies we own suspended their dividends for a period of time. Um, so we committed to pay 4.4 cents this year. Um, and as the dividends return, hopefully through time, we can recommit to a dividend for FY22. Um, obviously with the company having a surplus balance of franking credits, uh, we've been able to frank that dividends we think is another key part of the return that we can generate for dividend for investors going forward. So just to turn to the next slide. Um, so just in summary, you know, Whitehall QVE, it's a, a basket of very good quality X20 stocks. It's well diversified by sector. Often in this part of the market, it's less well, well researched and, and less understood. I think a lot of people invest in smaller companies for, for you know, short-term capital growth. We look at this sector where we can generate good capital growth over time and also generate some really good income. And as I said, since our inception in 98, um, it's an area of the market that we know well and we've generated really good returns for our investors over a long period of time. So with that, I'll, Tim, I'll hand back to you to the floor. Thanks, thanks, Simon. A couple of a couple of questions here. The the four cent dividend. What what's that roughly as a yield grossed up? Uh, well, it's four point. The, the share price, you know, it's four point four percent. But obviously, with the franking, it's well over five percent. Okay, great. And when you when you talk, you you, you run the Q the uh, QBE, the listed um, vehicle, and also the small cap um, fund. Do, do you find is the focus on QBE on income and bigger cap stocks? Look, because of the the nature of it being X twenty, um, obviously you look at the top top ten stocks. It's predominantly the larger quality, larger businesses that are better quality. So companies such as Sonic, uh, Tab Corp, and Crown. Um, but we also own those stocks like Events. Um, many of those stocks, such as Crown and Tab Corp, are in our Future Leaders Fund, which is an X fifty fund. So there's some overlap. But obviously the top twenty companies, such as Sonic and and Ampol and Horizon, are top fifty stocks. Um, and obviously, the good quality businesses, really good solid businesses, we think, are, you know, as I talked about before, uh, look pretty cheap considering where interest rates are. So we think there's some good value in that in that mid and, um, and X20 sector of the market. Um, and if you think about it, many equity investors gravitate to the names that they know, such as um, the CBAs and the Telstra's, um, and knowledge falls away quite quickly outside that sector. But, you know, as I said, we can buy some really good quality businesses, and we think there's a bit of a value disconnect in that in that sector, hence, you know, we think that there's good opportunities in terms of capital appreciation 
in stocks such as Horizon and even and Ampol uh, and Tabcorp, uh, and also can generate some good income. So it's a bit of both. And, and, and as an investment philosophy, growth has outperformed value for some time now. Yes. Where are we in that switch back to value? We've just started to see signs of uh, performance from value stocks. Yeah, look, it's a, there's been this ongoing debate about growth versus value. I, mean, I think um, I would count this more about fundamental investing, to be honest, Tim, than, than investing. I mean, as I showed you, all these charts have been, all these share prices have gone up really on news flow. And Afterpay is a great example. It's now a top 20 stock. But in terms of fundamental valuations, I, you know, it's very hard to get close to the share price. We, you know, very fully priced before, um, before you know the COVID correction. So it looks, you know, it's really about fundamentals for us. I think the the difference post COVID, if you like, is that, you know, pre COVID we were in an environment, an economy which was pretty low growth, and the only pop, only growth was really coming from population growth, and a lot of companies were struggling to grow their top line. Costs were creeping up, and EPS growth was difficult rates were relatively low and people were sort of gravitating to themes. So it was technology or health tech, uh, med tech was a sector, the lithium sector for a while, became very thematic. Post COVID, I feel, you know, the economy with so much fiscal and monetary stimulus in place, the government is really um, trying to encourage growth. Um, we're seeing sectors, whether it's housing or retail, um, you know, a range of sectors across the industry. We're seeing a lot of reshoring of supply chains so the fundamentals, I think, for the Australian industrial sector are quite strong. Um, and I think, you know, we're getting some f fundamental underlying growth, that's what I'm trying to say, in the earnings of these businesses. And I think that's really being, that's really seeing a gravitation return to some fundamental investing because there's growth in these industrial stocks. And I think that's drive, driven a part of, the, part of the theme. And I think the other theme is that you know, <coughs> there's, there's a perception that interest rates will stay low forever. Clearly, the inflation is a risk. Uh, and we've seen that reflected in higher bond yields. Um, bond rates, you know, back up to 1.6, 1.7 here in Australia. And this thought that interest rates would stay low forever, I think, is, is, is a misnomer. And, you know, within, in a higher interest rate environment, I think people become a little more cautious with their money and start to look for, you know, true fundamental underlying values. And you can only push a bubble so far too, Tim. So I think if we're in an environment where there's a bit of a rotation, how long it goes for, I'm not sure. Can value and growth both perform well for a period of time? <clears throat> potentially. I think longer term, you really have to focus on fundamentals and underlying good quality businesses. And I think that's, you know, that's where the portfolio is positioned because I think over the longer term, those businesses will deliver much cons more consistent outcomes um, for investors, you know, the capital protection on the downside, bit of income, but also capital growth going forward.